right. Well, welcome, everyone. I think that was a really powerful way to kind of start this conversation. Um, the statistics are startling, and even I, who know and hear them all the time, um, continue to be surprised and, quite honestly, outraged by what the data is telling us, that we are failing women. Um, on behalf of the Women's Alzheimer's Na Movement um, at Cleveland Clinic and the Society for Women's Health Research, thank you so much for joining us today um, for our program, The Power of Research Bridging the Gap. I'm Katie Schubert. I'm president and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research, which is a national nonprofit founded in 1990 dedicated to promoting research on biological sex differences in disease and improving women's health through science policy and education. Our mission is to make women's health mainstream. Today, we're so grateful to be co-hosting this event with Maria Shriver and WAM at Cleveland Clinic, the preeminent organization for women and Alzheimer's and funders of the WAM research grants. It turns out that our two organizations are very much aligned in our mission, and today we're happy to shine the spotlight on WAM's vision of a future in which Alzheimer's will no longer destroy the lives of women and their families. Thank you, Maria, for your leadership um, in this endeavor and Cleveland Clinic for partnering with WAM and being here in force today. And thank you to our distinguished guests, all of whom are leaders in this field as well. I know you all were networking earlier, so continue, you know, make sure you're making those connections because everyone in this room is so important and an important part of, of, of what we're trying to do here. Um, we chose to host this conversation in this room that we are in for a very specific and very historic reason. 21 years ago this July, here at the National Press Club, the Women's Health Initiative Steering Committee at the NIH gathered a press conference to announce that it was abruptly ending what had been the largest study ever undertaken on postmenopausal women. Why? Because they were, there were disturbing reports that women taking hormone replacement therapy to treat menopausal symptoms were showing an increased risk of heart disease, stroke, and certain cancers. And in order to protect women in the future, they argued, they had to end the study immediately. Almost overnight, America's doctors and women took their cue from this ominous news and stopped using hormones. But it turns out that the decision to halt the study was made in haste. It led to confusion for decades um, and has had dire consequences for our understanding of women's health ever since. The good news is today we're here, we're back in this room. Um, we're gonna talk about how to change that and how to move forward, how to talk about the future, and as you'll soon hear, the future is bright. It's only bright, though, if we can invest in it. If we commit to finding the answer as to why women are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's disease, as both patients and caregivers, and why women are disproportionately impacted by so many other diseases as well, we'll never know the answer to these questions without doing the research, and that's why we're here. To start us off is the kind of doctor that we need as a leader in this space. Dr. Barry Ridgway isn't simply a gifted obstetrician gynecologist. She is also chief of staff at Cleveland Clinic, and in that capacity leads a team of nearly 4,500 physicians, scientists, and doctors committed to inventing the future of healthcare to advance world-class clinical care, research, education, and innovation globally. She previously served as Institute Chair of the Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Women's Health Institute and inaugural ac academic chair for the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Biology. At the core of everything that Dr. Ridgway and the broader Cleveland Clinic team does is a focus on putting patients first. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ridgway. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm thrilled to be here today among such a wonderful group of colleagues, friends, and advocates. When women's health was disrupted in this room nearly 20 years ago, I was an intern in obstetrics and gynecology. I vividly remember wondering why results from a study that evaluated a high-risk cohort were being generalized to all women. Since that time, I finished my training, became a mother, partnered with thousands of women to improve their lives, lost my own mother to a neurocognitive disorder, and entered midlife myself. 
Well, navigating the past 20 years, despite the knowledge, connections, and privilege that I have, I can attest that there is so much we don't know. And there's good reason why. It wasn't until the 90s that the NIH legally required women and minority groups to be included in clinical research. The downstream effects of this disparity are overwhelming, leaving us with questions like, how does menopause affect the brain? Why are black Americans nearly twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's and related disorders compared to whites? And why will one in two women be diagnosed with a neurological disorder in her lifetime? The only way we will address the many medical disparities that affect women is through appropriately funded research performed by dedicated teams. I'm proud to be part of an organization focused on addressing these questions with prospective research. In early 2022, we launched the Cleveland Clinic Brain Study to better understand the mechanisms of neurological diseases. The landmark study aims to pinpoint disease biomarkers early, well before the clinical symptoms manifest. This week, we are on track to attain the first thousand participants tested in the study. And nearly three quarters of the research participants are women. While we have a lot of ground to make up, we are grateful to have the many partnerships that help us do just that, including the Society for Women's Health Research and the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, also known as WAM, Today, we will be hearing later in the program about the impact of WAM research grants, including two Cleveland Clinic researchers, Dr. Lynn Beckris and Dr. Rena Mera. Despite our progress towards health and research equity, we need champions from diverse sectors such as government, healthcare, and the community. I'm thrilled to introduce our next speaker, one of our advocates extraordinaire, while it's true she is a mother, a grandmother, a New York Times bestselling author, an award-winning journalist, today I recognize her as a disruptor and innovator, a woman on a mission who started a movement with the release of the 2010 Shriver Report, a revolutionary report that brought to light that women are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's disease. I'm so proud to consider her a partner. She is the founder of WAM and strategic advisor to Cleveland Clinic on women's health and Alzheimer's. Please welcome Maria Shriver. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, so much. I'm thrilled to be in partnership with you and everybody at the Cleveland Clinic to try to understand why women are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's, but also to broadly look at women's lifespan, their health span, particularly women at midlife, uh, to make their passage through life better, healthier, and more just. Katie, I don't know where you went. Um, do you want to sit down? I'm there, over there. Okay. I'm so honored to be partnering with you. The society has been a leader in this space, bringing women's health research to the forefront. I know there are so many people in this room that began many years ago, many decades ago, to put this organization on the map. Uh, I stand on their shoulders. We all stand on the shoulders of so many women who have paved uh, this road for us, ahead of us, and who uh, really push the boulder uphill. Uh, we're still pushing the boulder uphill, and it's so much better to push it with other women up the hill and so many uh, great men who are here today who understand uh, that women's health, uh, the gap that we talk about here, bridging the gap, is really beneficial to all of us. Uh, I think as Katie mentioned and as Barry mentioned, uh, and it's worth mentioning that the gap is still huge. There's hope out there to close it, but it's still way too big. Uh, WAM was founded on the premise that 
asking the question why women are at the epicenter of Alzheimer's disease. And when we asked that question, we were met with, well, we don't know that, but we really don't know anything or very little about what happens to women in midlife. In fact, we don't know why women are as sick as they are. So WAM was founded to fund research into women's brains, into women's bodies, to understand, as I said, particularly at midlife, what is happening to women's brains. And I'm really proud of the 44, now 46, uh, really cutting edge research grants that WAM has given out. We merged with the Cleveland Clinic about a year and a half ago because our mission is bigger than just what we could do alone. We want to fund more. We want to bring this message globally because, uh, as my friend George Vredenberg said when we were standing over here earlier today, uh, Alzheimer's is a global issue. Caregiving is a global issue. And women are at the epicenter of both of those things. And women, as you saw at this, the video, which I thought was so terrific, are sicker than ever. And nobody knows why that is. And that is unacceptable. Uh, it is maddening, it is unacceptable, and it will be up to us to do better, to fix that gap. And so I'm really honored to be here today, as I say, with so many sheroes, women warriors, and people who believe uh, in research and believe that the research will give us the dramatic reset that this country and the women in this country deserve. So I'm really happy to be able to bring up the three women who I have uh, worked with and do work with uh, all the time who will have some answers to how do we bridge this gap, how do we get the statistics uh, that we need, the knowledge that we need. Janine Clayton, uh, who leads the Office of Women's Health Research at NIH, uh, we have spoken before and she is um, a great colleague and is doing an extraordinary job, but she needs our help to do more. So she's gonna talk about that, come on up. Uh, there, uh, where is uh, Jessica Caldwell, who runs the Women's Alzheimer's Movement Research, Prevention Research at Cleveland Clinic in Vegas. The first uh, center of its kind, the Women's Alzheimer's Prevention Center in Vegas is here. She'll come on up. And Dr. Lisa Moscone, who WAM has funded for several years now, runs the Women's Brain Initiative at Cornell Weill. And she was showing me in the bathroom before everybody got here the exciting images that just came through where for the first time she can see a woman's brain at midlife and what happens to a woman's brain when it's perimenopausal and when it's menopausal. And you can actually see the differences for the very first time about how inflammation goes down and you can see how the energy sources change and she has that and she said even when I have these pictures I get pushback against people telling me that I can't see what I'm actually seeing so you can understand a little bit about what we're up against so come on up here Okay, so Janine, let me begin with you because as we all looked at the video, and we're gonna to try to keep this moving because I know everybody in Washington is busy and has to get back to really important jobs. So Janine, um, or that's what I'm always told. Um, uh, Janine, those, those statistics were really, uh, they're startling, they're maddening, not just about Alzheimer's, but about lupus, about autoimmune disease, about depression, about anxiety. And the answer is always, we don't know why. Why don't we know why? So you heard from Dr. Schubert, and first, Maria, thank you so much for including me today, and great to see everybody here. But you heard from Dr. Schubert right up front that women were not always included in NIH-supported clinical research because we did not know how important it was to look at both women and men. So from a historical perspective, we have many, many years of catching up to do. It wasn't until the NIH Revitalization Act in 1993, as Katie mentioned, that women were required to be in the research. Why is that so important? Well, if you're doing research on men and you're applying the findings to women, that's a problem. And so now we know that's a problem, so we do include women. And the great news is today, over half of the participants of NIH-supported research are women, but we have a lot of catching up to do. And it's not just the clinical studies, it's also the animal model studies that inform those clinical studies and allow us to test hypotheses. 
and we were using mostly male animals as well. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is there's been an over-reliance on male animals, male humans, for years, and now we're catching up and we have made a lot of progress, but there's a lot more yet to do. So how do we catch up for women who are particularly at midlife, who are facing big decisions about being perimenopausal, menopausal, who are screaming about the Women's Health Initiative, who are demanding a redo of that, who say, I need the information now, I'm sick, I'm dying, my mother is uh, getting no answers at all about her health. When will the answers come for them? And so, what needs to happen so they can get answers in the here and now? So to get more answers into the hands of more women and more healthcare providers, we need research that pays attention to the needs of women, that center the way women show up with diseases. We present differently with the disease, with heart disease, for example, and many others. So studies designed to look at the health of women, the way women experience their lives, so we need to shift that, how we do those studies. One of the ways we've done that is by having a new policy. I talked about the inclusion policy, but we also have the sex as a biological variable policy that I was really privileged to help uh, lead architecting at NIH. So now we have to look at why being female might affect the outcome of a study why looking at males and females and comparing them might be important. So doing research differently, research, the word research literally means to look again. So do we have, we hear a lot uh, in the Congress about mood shots for cancer. Uh, I've testified a couple times about increased funding for Alzheimer's funding. I never hear about a mood shot for women's health funding. So this year, Congress is very interested in these issues, and the last year, last year, they actually asked us to look at NIH investments in women's health research. So we had a women's health conference that did just that. They were particularly interested in maternal mortality, which as you know in our country, is going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Cervical cancer survival, which even though we have an amazing HPV vaccine, women are still dying from cervical cancer, and we see disparities there and chronic diseases. When we looked at our NIH research portfolio, we saw that there are, chronic disease in women is understudied and there are needs there. So we published a report that outlines those gaps and these areas are indeed understudied. But do you have the funding? Are you getting the funding? Is there a movement to get the funding to so study this? This year, Congress thought this was so important that they gave us an additional $10 million to, to form an Office of Autoimmune Disease Research which 80% of autoimmune disease patients are women, 80%. And there are about 300 of these diseases. So that's one great step forward mm -hmm. for us to be able to address one particular area where the sex bias or sex difference is really profound, 80% uh, of those patients. So that's a great step forward. And of course, we'd love to see more women's health research. So Jessica, you run the Women's Alzheimer's Prevention Center at the Cleveland Clinic in Vegas, and you were saying when we opened the center, it was inundated with people who wanted to participate, who wanted to come. There's a several year waiting list. What are you hearing from the women who are there? What are you learning? Because they're also, by being at the center, they're part of research. What I hear from women almost unequivocally is that women are ready to make the change. They're aware that they're more at risk than men for Alzheimer's disease, and they really are looking for tools that they can put into place at midlife. So women in my clinic are 30 to 60. We're not talking about someone who has a memory problem. We're talking about young, healthy women who know that they're at risk because they have a parent with Alzheimer's disease. One of the things that I'm learning through the research and beginning to look at who comes into this clinic is that it's true that women, it, it appears that even in this population who are really motivated to make change, women are sick. So higher than expected rates of things like high blood pressure, diabetes, pre-diabetes, and I think what I'm taking home from all of this is that we have to let women know and educate the public better that all of these things are connected. So diabetes relates to Alzheimer's disease. High blood pressure relates to your brain health. What you do when you're 30 is really meaningful for what your life looks like at 65. So you were saying to me in the back room before you came out here that 
you know, women, uh, need, we need to talk to women when they're way younger uh, about what will happen to them in midlife and beyond. Uh, certainly when I was in my 20s, 30s, 40s, nobody was talking to me about really anything other than like, don't get pregnant, or do you want to get pregnant, and now you're pregnant, and that's about it, right? <laughs> and so, uh, but this is kind of, you know, in the grand scheme of things, people think of women's health in terms of reproductive health, and they don't talk to you about uh, associating how depression or anxiety can be related to menopause. They don't talk to you about at 30 years of age, what you can be doing for brain health. How are you trying to change that conversation? And do you find people interested in it, or do they say, show me the facts? I think that people are very, very interested in hearing about how they can support their brain health. Um, the big things that I'm noticing are that women just don't know that, like you're saying, reproductive health isn't just about hormones and reproduction. When you have hormone-based changes, you have changes in your brain. Estrogen directly supports memory function. And when people hear that, I can see something click, a light go on, because so many women experience changes in memory and cognition around the time that they have a hormone-based change. So we talk about things like baby brain, or we talk about menopause brain, and these are real things that happen to women that we that is just not talked about in the media. It's not, people are not educated about it by their doctors. And the other thing in the way that I'm trying to flip this script a little bit is that in addition to hearing about you know, your reproduction and don't get pregnant, women hear a lot about what exercise is good for for the way we look, but they don't hear things about why to exercise for your brain health. So how to eat, not for how you look, but how to eat to support your brain health. And I think that we need to create a different type of culture around these healthy behaviors where it's less about our looks and it's really more about how we want our entire life to, to look when we're 65, 75. So Lisa, we have known each other for years. I wrote the introduction to Lisa's book called The XX Brain. Uh, she's doing a new one on menopause. And she, for the first time, really looked uh, with these great images at a woman's brain that was perimenopausal, menopausal, and postmenopausal, and was really able to tell through technology about how a woman's brain changes when she enters perimenopause and menopause. Because most women used to think of that as a physical change yeah. for them, but they didn't associate it with a brain change and how that might put them on a path to Alzheimer's. What are you discovering that you find to be stunning in your lab? There have been a few, and we've been extremely grateful for your support, really, of our, of our work. Maria has, has single-handedly um, funded the most recent of our studies, which is currently embargoed, but we hope to share the results really soon. We, we started back in 2015, and I'll, I'll be honest, my background is in neuroscience and nuclear medicine, which is a branch of radiology. I would never have thought that I would be here today talking about menopause. And the reason I am is that my research, our brain imaging research, really showed us that menopause has a very strong, very overlooked impact on brain health. And the reason that I landed on menopause was really one of our patients. We were working on the early detection and prevention of Alzheimer's disease, which is what I specialize in, especially for women's brains. And we were trying to understand what would differentiate women's brains from men's brains in midlife, which is really when the first signs of Alzheimer's disease show up on brain imaging. And we knew there's a very, that there was a very strong impact of female sex, but what else? We looked at everything. We looked at genetic markers of Alzheimer's disease, like the APOE4 genotype. We looked at family history. We looked at diet. We looked at exercise. We looked at high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Nothing would co correlate with the, with the findings that we were seeing in these people's brains. And then one day, one of our patients was taking a cognitive test, which Jess can speak a lot more about than me, but she was doing cognitive testing, and she had to stop. And we were like, are you okay? Do you need a break? Do you need some water? And she said, 
I'm having a hot flash. I can't think straight. I need five minutes. We were like, you were having what? She's like, I'm having a hot flash. I'm in, I'm in menopause. And we're like, hot flashes, menopause. And then we went back. And we, work, we, we started working with the OBGYN department. And we screened all of our patients for menopausal status. And then we got this huge predictive finding that what we were seeing was actually menopause that was really discriminating between women's brains and men's brains. And what we find is that as you go through menopause, and we started mapping that by following women over time, from premenopausal stages to perimenopausal stages to postmenopausal stages, we do see that the brain changes. And the findings that Maria was talking about is that the very first thing we found in 2017, which I find it offensive, but it was the first brain imaging study that actually looked at women's brains before and after menopause. I found it very bizarre, but nonetheless, it was the first study, and they showed that your brain energy levels, your brain glucose metabolic activity takes a dip as women go through the perimenopause transition, which may well explain the brain fog, the memory lapses, and many other symptoms of menopause. And then we started looking at gray matter, and the gray matter was down during the transition to menopause. It seems to plateau afterwards, that we need to, to have replication studies for sure. And then we looked at Alzheimer's plaques that really take off during the transition to menopause for some women. To be clear, these are women with a family history of Alzheimer's disease and or an APOE4 genotype. We're not looking at women who do not have a family history or genetic risk factors. So that was shocking to me. I think that was the, the most surprising thing. But you were saying that even when you have images and you go to other doctors yeah. or researchers, you get pushback yeah. and against what you're actually trying to say. So what do you, what do you feel that, that when you come with the research, when you come with the data, when you come with the pictures, mm -hmm. do people want to just write it off? Is it because it's no. women or what? <laughs> I, that I don't know, but I, I think there's a concern that aging may be the, what we're actually seeing there. So women go through menopause, but at the same time, they also get older. So there is a legitimate concern that maybe it's aging rather than menopause. And so we, we try to tackle that in, in many, many different ways. The, the first one was, okay, then let's look at men. Right? Because if men of the same age are showing the same changes, then it's definitely aging and not menopause. So we started enrolling men and looking at men, and we found a very clear difference between men's brains and women's brains. Men's brains in midlife are broadly okay. Same men, same age, same risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. We do case control studies. We match them as best we can. And women's brains do not age the same way that men's age, and women's, men's brains don't go through menopause, women's brains do. And we statistically control for the effects of age. There's a very clear effect on menopause as well, but reviewers don't love statistics. And so what we're doing now is that we're following people over time, so we have the same person being their own control. And we also started enrolling women based on age. So now we have a group, this is what I was showing you before in the bathroom, which is that we have like premenopausal women who are like 50, 52, perimenopausal women who are exactly the same age, and postmenopausal, early postmenopausal women who are also 50, 52 years old. So age is taken into account really as best we can, and there's a very clear difference between these women's brains. Janine, you were saying that at uh, NIH, when you look at women, there is already an area to look at women in age. But there's nothing for women at midlife. There's nobody looking at this period of women who are like 40 to like 65. Because I guess after 65, you're considered aging. Right? <laughs> that midlife period is a period where there's not a lot of attention. From an NIH perspective, we create, with institutes and centers, 27 of them, an NIH-wide strategic plan for women's health research. And we include, very prominently, the importance of a life course perspective, with mid-age, mid midlife really highlighted. But it's not an area where a lot of people are focusing. They are focusing at other transition periods, childhood, adolescence, older adults. 
And we know that aging isn't, doesn't happen in a linear fashion, even though you're just adding one year to each of your birthdays. You are aging in fits and starts. These are transitions that are happening. And as you heard, they can have profound effects on different parts of your body, including your brain. So what would it take to actually focus on women at midlife, which is where women seem to be getting sicker? I mean, more and more women in their 40s are noticing, and it may be having to do with perimenopause or depression, increased anxiety, and then they go to try to get hormones to help with that, and they're told, oh, well, we're still going off of data from 20 years ago, don't take hormones, which is a whole other thing. So, um, but w what can be done for do we need an entire initiative to research women at midlife? So whenever we learn new knowledge, and research does that all the time, we need to address that information and that should inform how we approach new initiatives, new activities, new structural factors, for example. And so for, you know, when we have substance use issues in this country, we galvanized around that and we put resources around that to address those issues. But the key was interdisciplinary approaches where scientists and stakeholders from different sectors and different disciplines came together to solve the problem. And that's really what's needed and centering, valuing women and focusing on the importance of midlife because you have an opportunity there to prevent the development of chronic disease. That is a prime opportunity. But for so many women at midlife, it is the first time that they're going to their doctors asking about hormones. And we're sitting in the room where the Women's Health Initiative was uh, stopped abruptly. And so many women still meet the doctor that's giving them the information from 2002. And millions of women think, hey, we need a redo. We're de we deserve a redo from our government. They gave us erroneous information. They stopped it too short. Uh, we're dying out here, we're struggling out here, we need, you know, we're owed a redo. So the Women's Health Initiative, as you know, started very long ago, right. and it was based on what we understood at that time, and it was not a study that was designed to look at menopausal symptoms. It was a study that was designed to look at hormone therapy for the prevention of cardiovascular disease, stroke, and other conditions based on the fact that women were being treated with those hormones at that time because we thought we knew the answer. And research is the only way to definitively test to know the answer. And it was found that that particular formulation did not prevent those chronic diseases. I understand that people, their fears that have resulted from the study, and we've learned so much more since then. More studies have come out that have shown that it's important in terms of the timing when menopausal hormone therapy is given closer to the menopausal tr transition, perimenopausal, it can have a very different effect. And so now we are funding multiple studies, MS Brain, Ms. Flash, and several others. And we've identified, for example, two antidepressants that can be used to treat hot flashes and some other menopausal symptoms. But you're right, Maria, there are many more questions. And the only way to get the answers for those questions is through research that focuses on the specific needs. And there are clinically compelling questions that need to be asked and answered. So what question do you really want to answer with your research that you think will benefit women of all ethnic backgrounds and all ages? I have so many. <laughs> I have so many questions. I, I want to look at estrogen in the brain as you know, mm -hmm. which, strangely enough, has never been done in humans. I w would love to do an HRT trial in women of the right age, which is perimenopausal and very early postmenopausal women, where the outcomes are not incidence rates of Alzheimer's disease 30 years later, but biological markers of Alzheimer's disease now as I am treating you. And thanks to the NIH, we are actually funded to start such a clinical trial. So we are, we're, I'm hoping to start enrollment in June. This is with Dr. Roberta Diaz-Brinton at the University of Arizona, who's my mentor, is a legend in my field. She developed something super interesting, which is a designer estrogen, or a phytoserm, a selective estrogen receptor modulator, that very specifically supplies estrogen to the brain without impacting estrogen receptors in reproductive tissue. So it does not increase the risk of cancer, but it supports brain. It, we're hoping, obviously, to be, to be 
triple confirmed. But it does supply estrogen to the brain, and we're starting this trial. As I mentioned in June, these are going to be perimenopausal, early postmenopausal women who are going to be tested before we begin the trial to make sure that their brains are as healthy as they can be before we start, and they're going to receive brain scans also after, six months later. So I'm very excited about that. I would love to see more designer estrogens out there, and there are so many, many other things. But really, seeing women's brain health become a more of a priority and seeing more and more investigators also making it a priority, because for so many years, I, I've been trying to do this for, you know, since high school, <laughs> basically, as yes, <laughs> my parents are nuclear physicists, so I really <laughs> kind of grew into <laughs> both of them, plus my uncle and my aunt, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been trying to do this for a very, very long time. I moved to, to New York to do this as well. Um, it's wonderful to see more and more scientists doing this and really being <laughs> challenged in many ways, but also getting published and getting attention is wonderful that science can actually have an impact on culture. I think it's, it's phenomenal. And the NIH has been incredibly supportive and we're so grateful, and to you, Maria, really, really supportive and grateful. I think that's, that's the main goal, to really make sure that it's clear that reproductive health has an impact on brain health and that the health and the presence of your ovaries is crucial for the, for, for the health of your brain as well. If you think about it, for so many years, women who were undergoing hysterectomies were always, by default, counseled to have their ovaries taken out, also before menopause. And we now know that, yes, that does reduce your risk of future ovarian cancer, which is, however, very rare, but it, increase, it, it can really increase your risk of dementia, cardiovascular disease, of osteoporosis, of anxiety, of depression. So I think the science can have an impact on culture and hopefully will also have an impact on funding. I think that's Thank also you. the thing. You know, so many women I've talked to who have been counseled to have a hysterectomy were never counseled about the other things that could yes. uh, put them on a path to Alzheimer's dementia or other things. Uh, both of you run Alzheimer's Prevention Center. Uh, anybody with a brain wants to prevent Alzheimer's. We now kind of read that about 40% of all Alzheimer's and dementia cases may be preventable due to lifestyle choices. What should every single person in this room be doing today to perhaps increase their chances of not getting a neurological disease, preventing and or delaying dementia? That's a great question. There's so much that people can do right now to reduce risks of dementia. I tell people if you have little time to devote to prevention, the number one thing that you can likely do is exercise. Get your physical activity going. This is going to have a direct impact on your brain in the short term, in the long term. It also will have indirect effects on other types of risk factors like your heart health, your mood, your stress levels. If you've got exercise down, the next thing I tell people is make sure to prioritize your sleep. Sleep relates to so much. We consolidate memory during sleep. So even if we're not talking about a dementia risk, if you're not sleeping, you will not remember as well as if you're sleeping enough. And you also won't be giving your brain an optimal opportunity to clear proteins out that it doesn't need. And one of those is amyloid, that protein that builds up in Alzheimer's disease. So exercise, sleep, and the third one I would say is put good food in your body. Eat n nutritious food that's as less processed as you can, more toward Mediterranean style, less um, toward uh, process. And engage. Engage yes, in community. Absolutely. Isolation engage. is the death of all of us, right? So mm -hmm. engage, keep activating your brain, and join us as we try to bridge the gap, uh, which will take all of our brain power to try to kind of figure out how to build a movement uh, that puts women at the center of research, that puts women's health uh, where it deserves to be at NIH and in terms of the budget. And it, that's a nonpartisan uh, issue, one would think, um, and something we can all rally around. So I want to thank all three of you for joining us today, and, to, and they'll all be here if you want to talk uh, further to them as we try to keep this moving. So thank you all so much. Thank you. And, 
And as we mentioned, uh, research is what gives us the data. And now we're going to ask, this is something we do at every time we do a big women's uh, Alzheimer's movement research luncheon, is we ask the researchers to actually stand up and explain their research themselves. We've given out 44 uh, seed grants, groundbreaking grants. We're adding 45 and 46 today. Uh, and then we're also going to hear from some ongoing uh, grantee winners who will bring us up to date on the grants they got and what they are finding, the data they've already discovered. And we do it quite rapidly. It's kind of cool. So I'm going to let the researchers take it away from here. Right? <laughs> Hi. I'm Lynn Beckers, and I'm thrilled to be a 2023 um, WAM grant recipient. Uh, I'm a molecular biologist uh, with an Alzheimer's disease biomarker discovery lab at the Cleveland Clinic. I am also the daughter of a woman that died with Alzheimer's disease, and I'm a mother of three daughters. Uh, a challenge that the Alzheimer's disease research community faces is that evidence points to differences between women and men uh, in Alzheimer's disease hallmarks of amyloid and tau. These are two proteins that build up in the brain uh, of those with Alzheimer's disease. Also, the immune system plays an important role in the disease, and we've heard today that women are disproportionately affected by uh, immune system dysfunction. The problem is that even though dysfunctional immune response is now known to play a strong role in Alzheimer's disease, we have not defined the difference between women and men in their immune response to Alzheimer's disease hallmarks of amyloid and tau. Fortunately, alterations in the immune response can be measured in the blood. So my goal is to tease apart the differences between women and men in their blood proteome uh, that is, proteins in the blood, uh, such as immune system-related proteins. The amazing thing is that we now can do this by measuring over 7,000 proteins at once in a single sample of plasma extracted from blood. My hope is that our research will provide a blood-based test that can easily be used to test women with Alzheimer's disease hallmarks for changes in the immune system with the exciting ultimate goal of using existing immune-related therapeutics and promising new ones to slow or stop disease progression before there is severe memory loss. So first, we critically need a blood-based biomarker tool to identify specific patients that need the treatment. So this project will help get us there. So I'm very glad that WAM finds this research promising and I'm honored to join this dedicated team. And I'm excited to get started, uh, not only because of the science um, that needs more answers, but also because of my family history, which makes this uh, work very important to me. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rena Mira. I'm just so honored to be here and uh, to be a recipient of the Women's Alzheimer's Movement Award. Um, th thank you sincerely to Maria Shriver, to her team, Sandy Gleistein, and who's been clearly the glue that's keeping things together here. And I want to also give a shout out to Mariska Brown, Dr. Brown, who's the director of the National Center on Sleep Disorders Research, and I think Vanessa Gonzalez from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, who's joined us here today. And I am just so appreciative of recognizing the importance, as was already mentioned, of sleep and circadian rhythm biology in the, um, in the science of, of Alzheimer's disease and how this plays a role in women. So I'm a passionate researcher for the last 20 years focused on how sleep and circadian rhythm impacts our health and disease. And so what will we study with this award? What do we know so far? We know that sleep and circadian rhythm disruption is so common in women across the lifespan and negatively impacts our quality of life. We know that simply not getting enough sleep 
impacts our neurobiology and clearance of the important, important proteins implicated in Alzheimer's biology. In fact, these changes are noted even after one night of sleep deprivation. We also know that sleep apnea, an entity where there's repetitive episodes of stopping breathing with intermittent lowering of oxygen, also has relationships with Alzheimer's. And yet we do not know the sex-specific differences that are involved with sleep-disordered breathing in women compared to men. What we do not know is what Maria Shriver was saying earlier, is how does this impact our biology? Um, and that is what we aim to look at and examine further. So we have collected some exciting um, some data on an ongoing prospective cohort um, where we are longitudinally collecting data on overnight sleep studies and actigraphy. However, we have not yet delved into these data, and we also are able to integrate these data with existing biospecimens that have been collected uh, from the immune AD cohort. So our award will help us delve into these interrelationships further in terms of how sleep and circadian rhythm biology is implicated in sex-specific differences in Alzheimer's, and we are incredibly uh, grateful for this award, which will be critical to serve as a catalyst and a launch pad to better understand these relationships. This is incredibly exciting as it can set the stage for us to develop more personalized treatments focused on sleep and circadian rhythm disruption for women with Alzheimer's disease. Thank you so very much. Hi, I'm Liz Krastel, and I'm a professor at University of California, Irvine. Um, and we've talked today about the difference between um, the sort of high uh, sex difference between men and women at risk factors for Alzheimer's. But something else that has a big sex difference is uh, spatial navigation ability. And you might think that's kind of a strange <laughs> connection. But in fact, the neural circuitry is involved with spatial navigation is actually the same circuitry that is um, the earliest affected by Alzheimer's disease, entorhinal cortex and hippocampus. And so uh, navigation has actually emerged as a very early marker for Alzheimer's um, risk factors for people who might be at risk, even at a very early age, even you know decades before the onset of any symptoms. And we also know that um, getting disoriented and lost is one of the earliest um, uh, uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's. And so sort of making this connection is really important. Um, so furthermore, these areas um, in the brain um, that have, uh, are important for navigation also have a lot of estrogen receptors, um, as we heard about earlier. And so um, uh, we're very interested in that connection. And so we know that um, thinking about the menopausal transition, um, this change over time, we're using spatial navigation, uh, menopause, sort of putting this all together um, to, be, to develop an earlier uh, behavioral and cognitive marker for um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, so together with my collaborator, um, Dr. Emily Jacobs at um, UC Santa Barbara, um, we've been working together to look at the changes in the brain during menopause. We've also been seeing a lot of interesting um, structural and functional changes during um, the menopause transition, and then relating that to um, the navigation behavior so that we can hopefully then use that as a marker. So my lab has is a big empty room. Um, we have used virtual reality um, to um, uh, test navigation behavior. Um, so we put people in these virtual mazes, they walk around and uh, get lost or not, <laughs> um, and to see how they perform. And so we can connect that with the brain data, and so we see very different ways that men rely on their brains to do some of these uh, tasks versus the way women do. Um, and we actually see differences over the course of menopause. So premenopausal women sort of rely on one circuitry and men rely on another, and as they progress, the postmenopausal women look a lot more like the men. Um, and so we're seeing these really interesting differences in how they might change. And so this is a cross-sectional study. We hope to eventually do longitudinal work with this. Um, and then again, to see who's at risk uh, long term. So again, if you're bad at navigating when you're 20, <laughs> are you more likely to develop Alzheimer's? Is it a change at a critical time window? We expect to see very um, um, strong declines during the menopause puzzle transition um, and to understand how that might be related. Um, we've also been doing some really fun work with pregnancy, which is a different study, but it's looking at how the brain changes with pregnancy. Um, and um, so uh, all together working uh, throughout these um, different symptomologies to say um, who might be at risk at an earlier stage and then hopefully develop some treatments or other ways to uh, mitigate some of these symptoms or to create training or other things that people might be able to do to, to develop some resilience. So we're really grateful to the, the women
women's Alzheimer's movement and to this um, lovely cohort of people here today who support it um, because uh, we're really excited to do a lot more work in this area. Thanks. Hi, I'm Dean Ornish. Good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here today and I want to thank uh, Maria Shriver and Sandy Gleistein and all of your colleagues for helping to support our work, as well as uh, George Vradenberg from the Essex Against Alzheimer's Foundation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a uh, founder and president of the nonprofit Preventive Medicine Research Institute and a clinical professor of medicine at uh, UCSF. And for the past 45 years, I've directed clinical trials showing what a powerful difference changes in diet and lifestyle can make, and not only helping to prevent, but actually reversing the progression of the most common and costly chronic diseases. We were able to show for the first time that heart disease could be reversed, and later type 2 diabetes, hypertension, obesity, early stage prostate cancer. We did a study with uh, Craig Venter showing that when you change your lifestyle, 500 genes are changed, turning on the good genes, turning off the bad genes in just a few months. With Elizabeth Blackbird showing that we could actually lengthen telomeres for the first time, uh, the parts of your chromosomes that regulate cellular aging. And I think we're to play, and we published our findings in all the leading peer-reviewed journals. Um, it's these same lifestyle changes that could reverse so many different conditions, and why is that? And the reason is that they're not as different as we thought. They all share the same underlying biological mechanisms, things like chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in the microbiome, and telomeres, and gene expression, and so on. And each of these mechanisms, in turn, is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and social support we have, or eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. And, you know, we know what's good for your heart is good for your brain, and Alzheimer's shares many of these same underlying biological mechanisms that these other chronic conditions do. And it's been shown, you know, 45 years ago when I started doing research on heart disease, it was thought that once you had heart disease, the best you could do was to slow down the rate at which you, at which you get worse, much as people think about Alzheimer's today. We found if you make bigger changes and a lot of things at the same time, you could actually reverse the progression of heart disease. And we're hoping the same may be true for Alzheimer's as well. So we'll find out. We're in the middle of doing a clinical trial. It's a randomized con controlled clinical trial with some of the leading neurologists at Harvard and Mass General and UCSF and UC San Diego and other places uh, to see if we can find out whether this is true or not. And, um, you know, Mia Kivipelto in the finger study showed that less intensive lifestyle interventions can slow the rate of progression into dementia. My hypothesis, maybe more intensive ones may stop and perhaps even reverse it. You know, ounce of prevention, pound of cure. So stay tuned. Thank you. Hello. I was just trying to make sure it was uh, my time. My name is Dr. Kendra Ray, and I am a music therapist. I'm hearing my research is much different from a lot of people's here today, so I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about it. I do work at Menorah Center. It's a nursing and rehab facility, which is located in Brooklyn, New York. Um, approximately 60% of unpaid caregivers of people with dementia are women. Whether that be a wife, a daughter, a granddaughter, or a relative, um, the women carry the load. Along with this comes high rates of burden. Burden for these women comes in the form of stress, depression, anxiety, cardiovascular issues, and other forms of self-neglect that lead to chronic conditions. So my study was founded by both the Alzheimer's Association and WHAM, and it's investigating the use of a music-based psychosocial intervention by teaching caregivers how to use music at home. Um, but given we were in the times of COVID, a lot of this teaching was done by Zoom, but we worked with families to teach them how to use music to soothe patients, to make them feel more connected um, to their memories, and to find moments of joy with their caregiver. We have found that um, after only six weeks of incorporating music-based interventions like singing, um, that people with dementia are experiencing a higher quality of life, less neuropsychiatric symptoms like depression or agitation, which in turn reduces caregiver burden. On a final note about the needs to support young early researchers like myself when we enter the field of studying dementia, I couldn't have gotten the study off the ground without the support of WAM and the Alzheimer's Association. So I just wanted to really tell you thank you very much for doing that. And um, 
it really has helped me to become a leader in the field um, and help to collect scientific data that we need to develop the most effective, effective caregiving tools to help relieve the burden um, on American families. And I'm really, really grateful for this. Thank you. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Laurie Cox. Uh, I'm from Brigham and Women's Hospital in Harvard Medical School. And I just wanna say how inspiring this organization is and how, uh, and everybody in this room and just really wanted to thank Maria Shriver and all of the advocacy work from women's Alzheimer's movement. Uh, so I'm a previous, e a previous grant awardee from WAM. Uh, and I'm a microbiome scientist, so we think a lot about the brain, but your gut microbiome can really affect so many aspects of life, can affect your immune system, can even affect hormones. And we know that the gut microbiome has many, many protective actions throughout life. But through aging and changes in hormones and immunosenescence, the microbiome can really change and shift and start to contribute to cognitive decline. So in some of the studies uh, funded by WAM, we actually found that giving this calorie restriction diet uh, only protected plaques in female mice. And we found that this was linked to changes in the gut microbiome. So uh, moving on to really studying how this could really affect the brain, we actually found that the microbial changes were blocking immune-mediated clearance of these amyloid plaques. And so having this overgrowth of the microbe would stop a repair process. So we're hoping to understand the biology of what's happening in this so that we can come up with microbial-based treatments that are safer and easier to administer for many decades of life that would be uh, uh, tolerated at much higher levels. So we're incredibly thankful for, for this funding and support and launching new initiatives to study the role of the gut microbiome in various life stages, including um, early life, midlife, and in aging. And we're in fact seeing different results if we apply antibiotics in early life uh, versus in, in aging. We actually see a beneficial effect in aging, but no protective effect in females in early life, where we do see a protective effect in males. So we're using many of these models, these experimental approaches to understand what are the good microbes, and someday we hope to really have new ways to intervene. And so lastly, I'll just say that uh, this WAM uh, award came at a really important time in my own career, uh, and it helped me actually establish my own lab and get uh, promoted to assistant professor, and then start to recruit and train this next generation of scientists. So um, thank you, uh, Maria and WAM, uh, for all the support over the years. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to come today. My name's Jackie Torfin, so it's Jacqueline, but it's Jackie. Um, and you're my people. I'm so excited to be with all these scientists um, because my uh, last 35 years of my career has been spent as a clinical research um, QA and regulatory person keeping you guys out of jail. So if you need any tips, <laughs> let me know. Um, and today is my public coming out. Um, like, my close family and friends know that I was diagnosed recently with early onset Alzheimer's. And actually, I'm not even sad about it, so I don't know why I'm crying. Um, it's just a little emotional. I own my own business, and it's a little scary to come out and say, hey, um, Please come and pay me to give you um, advice and my knowledge, but I have Alzheimer's and I'm sorry about that. But I'm still smart and I'm still funny, um, so that's a little daunting. Um, but I think it's okay. I really am extremely hopeful. Uh, there's a lot of information. It's super overwhelming. I know how to do this. I know how to read research. I know how to talk to doctors. I advocated strongly to get a diagnosis because I was 55. Um, and they said, come back in a year. We'll do some more cognitive testing, and then we'll go from there. I'm like, I need to know if I need to tell my kids to start having children out of wedlock. <laughs> so I 
I need more time than that. I'm, you know, and, I, and I'm not 70. I'm not 75. I'm 56. Um, so I pushed, and I advocated, and I got the testing, and I, and I got the diagnosis. And I was upset for a little bit. I was horrified because my husband's quite older than I am, and I'm like, what the hell? Like, I thought he would be the one, but it's going to be me, possibly. Um, so then I got over it, and it's okay. And I started reading a lot, and I started figuring it out, and I changed my diet, and I try to sleep. It's not always easy. Um, I always exercised religiously, so that's been easy. Um, and there's a lot, I think, that we can do. And I'm not freaking out. And I want to talk about it. And I want people to know that if you are diagnosed, you can do things. And you can still be productive. And you can still do the right stuff. So I'm excited to I don't know if I'll post it on Facebook or LinkedIn or anything, but you know, I'm excited to talk about it with my colleagues and I'm excited to tell people that this is a thing and it's happening and we're gonna figure it out. So thank you so much for all the research that you're doing. It's incredibly meaningful and um, I really appreciate it. I just, uh, I just want to say uh, that it's because of women like you that we are, and there are millions behind you, women and men, that all of these researchers do what they do. And it is because of people who are courageous like you that we can begin to change the narrative and the face around this disease. And there was a great piece that I saw in the Washington Post yesterday, which was a lot of people like you saying, I'm getting this diagnosis, I'm in my 50s, I'm in my 60s, I'm going to push up against this. I'm going to continue to work. I'm going to run a marathon. I'm going to be a volunteer. I'm going to live my life, and I'm going to push up against this disease. And you are single-handedly changing what people think when they think of Alzheimer's. And I just want to say thank you for having the courage and the guts to do that. And we're with you. And we're funding research that I hope will help uh, and in your lifetime, that we're going to accelerate it and push it. And I want to thank you for choosing us as your coming out party. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I, we wanted to thank all of you, obviously, for coming here today. We wanted to keep this on time. Uh, we wanted to uh, make it interesting, make it inspirational, make it hopeful. Uh, when I got involved with Alzheimer's, everything I went to was depressing. Um, so we well, really wanted to do something together uh, that would be inspiring, that would be hopeful. And I just want to say all of the researchers, they just blow me away. I'm just uh, in such awe of what you do. It's behind the scenes. It's in small labs. Laura, I came to see you. I'm just like, wow. I was in Houston last week, and they were researching fruit flies. I was just like, damn. Uh, I was like, a fruit fly? But she's like, it has all the secrets in it. And I was like, wow, OK. You know. So uh, there's a lot going on that's hopeful. If we can accelerate it, it'll be even better. If we can get huge funding for this, it'll be even bigger. Um, and we're committed to doing that. Yeah. You asked a really important question that I'm going to sort of put out there, and it's something that I think our team at the Society has heard me say multiple times, so I was super excited when you said it. Why don't we have uh, something like a moonshot for women's health research? Maybe I'd call it something involving Venus, I don't know, but, um, but I do think like that, that's a huge piece of this work. Um, it's so fragmented. So I think hearing the stories and the energy, thank you for bringing everyone together um, so that we can really talk about this. And I think, again, and Jackie, thank you for sharing your story. I know um, it can be really hard, particularly in a room full of people staring at you, um, but I, I think you're right, Maria, the, the face 
of Alzheimer's, um, it's right here. And so we really need to reframe this conversation in a meaningful way um, and really get the data to be able to help us um, move these issues forward. Yeah, so I wanna thank you for partnering with us. I'm a big believer in collaborating and that the more of us that kind of come together, that share information, that work towards the same end, we're going to get there m that much faster. I also want to shout out Sandy Gleistein, I know, who, Sandy. Sa yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sandy and I have been working together since we were 30 years old. We started at NBC in an edit room and on a shoot, and we've gotten all the way to women's science research. So uh, this luncheon wouldn't have happened, and so much of the women's Alzheimer's movement wouldn't happen without her. And she brought her 91-year-old mother. Where is she? Right who, there. there she is, <laughs> who is... Uh, who uh, lives here in Washington, is studying French, uh, went to graduate school in her 80s, and I was just like, damn. Uh, you know, I was like, it's the way it is. I'm just going to keep on going. So that's the model that we're all headed for. So, and I know some people sponsored today's yes. lunch, and so I want to thank them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Our silver sponsors, Eli Lilly and Company, ESA, Kensington Senior Living, Krauss Financial Services, and our bronze sponsor, Biogen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you. Um, I'll also shout out Emma in the back on our team because she jumped right in. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I know out. you have a big gala tomorrow night, so <laughs> this was, you know, kind of just like, oh my God, let's do it and let's make We're it happen. We're going to do it. Yeah, of course. And I want to shout out my brother who came. I have four brothers, only one came. So Mark, he gets so you're the thing. favorite. Yeah. So he's the favorite right now. And my sister-in-law Linda and my sister-in-law Jeannie. I I think, you know, this is a, a disease. Our father was diagnosed in 2003, but it impacted Jeannie's mother also had Alzheimer's. So it impacts the entire family. It impacts the community. And uh, all of the families I've met are united in wanting to find a cure or wanting to find something that they can do that helps their loved one and that also helps their own uh, path to aging. And since I am, uh, I guess I'm beyond midlife now, but uh, I'm tired of going to the doctor and being told, well, you know, Maria, we just don't know. And then I'm saying, but I actually do know because I've been talking to researchers and they tell me to do this and they're like, oh, where are you getting your information? And I go, Lisa Moscone, Laura Cox, et cetera. So that's both a good and bad sign. But um, I'm hopeful that the research that's being done through this organization and so many other great organizations will make its way into the doctor's office and meet women where they are, which is, uh, and they desperately need this information. So I know you're committed to that too. And I want to thank you all for taking time from really busy uh, careers and uh, jobs that are saving the country. So thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.